In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about max locks per transaction, logical replication, backup and recovery, and PG Bouncer. I'm Creston Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 95. All right, I hope everyone had a great holiday season and happy new year to you. Uh, we've had a break for about two weeks and it's time to get started for the new year. And I've actually gone through the past two weeks because there wasn't much content and collected all of it that uh, should have been missed. So this should include everything that occurred over the past uh, almost three weeks now. Our first piece of content is PostgreSQL you might need to increase max locks per transaction. And this is from cyberdeck-postgresql.com. And basically uh, he's indicating here, you may see an error that says out of shared memory. And it basically indicates you might need to increase, increase max locks per transaction. And he shows you where you can actually see this. If you generate uh, 20,000 create table statements to create that many tables, and he used this uh, generic generate series function to be able to uh, use these statements and create all these tables. And eventually it says error out of shared memory. Hint, you might need to increase max locks per transaction. So because this is all occurring within one transaction, it can't create that many locks. And by default, if you do a show max locks transactions at 64, so you may need to increase that if you wanted to have more locks per transaction. Now, I've seen this myself sometimes when doing a PG dump, when I've had an incredibly high number of tables. This may have only impact earlier versions, but I actually had to increase max locks per transaction to be able to handle a PG dump with a large number of tables in the database. And he says uh, something interesting of note here, the number of locks we can keep in shared memory is max connections times max locks per transaction. Uh, keep in mind that row level locks are not relevant here. So for example, doing a select all from a table with a lot of rows for update, these row locks are stored on disk and not in RAM. So something to keep in mind. Now, he also mentions here, if you want to see what kind of locks are in action, you can use the PG locks table. So he discusses that, how you can query it to find out uh, what locks are present. Now, another issue that you may see this for is if you're doing partitioning and how it can relate to this out of shared memory error. So he used this to code to be to generate 1,000 partitions and then simply querying the parent table is going to hit all 1,000 partitions and you'll see in PG locks that it generates over 1,000 access share locks trying to pull back all the data for all of this. So this is something else that could hit that limit of max locks transaction. So great blog post talking about max locks per transaction as well as the uh, out of shared memory error that you may see in your installation. So definitely a blog post to check out. The next post is recovery.conf is gone in PostgreSQL 12. And this is also from cybertech-postgresql.com. And basically this follows on with a number of other posts that we've seen where version 12 has gotten rid of recovery.conf. You now do those configuration changes in the postgresql.conf file. So now instead of the recovery.conf file being present, you either have two signal files, a recovery signal file that tells Postgres, Postgres to enter normal archive recovery, or a standby sig dot signal file that tells Postgres to enter a standby mode. And they go over some different considerations here. And basically your backups don't really need to change, but restoration processes need to change as well as how you set up uh, replicas now because these will be impacted by these changes. And he also advocates use of the postgresql.auto.com file because that's something set by alter system commands and generally is what's happening with PG based backup now. And he says, if you do use third party software, here are the particular versions of PG backrest PG Pro Backup and Barman that you should be using that support uh, ver PostgreSQL version 12 and its new recovery scheme or recovery process. So yet another post to review if you're making the transition to PostgreSQL 12 and then what changes you need to make with regard to recovery or your replicas. The next post is actually a YouTube channel where they've posted updated presentations for PG Day Paris. So this is the PG Day Paris YouTube channel and there's about eight presentations here that they posted for what happened in uh, 2019. So if you're interested in some video content, definitely a link to check out. 
Another piece of video content is a logical replication in PostgreSQL. And this is from the Enterprise DB YouTube channel. And they're basically talking about what is logical replication and how to set it up, how to use it, and all of those sorts of things. Now, this is a webinar is about 54 minutes in length, and it's about the 12 minute mark where it really starts into the meat of the presentation. Uh, but definitely, if you're interested in logical replication, this is a presentation to check out. And the third piece of video content is actually a webinar. You forgot to put the where in delete, <laughs> which implies you've probably deleted a lot of data you didn't mean to. So this talks about uh, descriptions of database backups, the type of backups you can take from PostgreSQL server, basically logical based backed up where you're backing up objects or physical based backed up where you're backing up the raw files and how to do that. Uh, different use cases for backups, uh, disaster scenarios, and what are the best ways to recover from them. So, you know, you didn't put the where in the delete statement or server hardware has crashed, you know, what are some different ways to handle recovery scenarios and things to consider when taking backups. So uh, th again, this is about an hour in length webinar. So if you're interested in this content, definitely uh, check it out and you can click the link here to go ahead and register and you'll get uh, immediate access to the webinar. The next piece of content is PostgreSQL Connection Pooling, Part 2 PG Bouncer. So this is a second post about PG Bouncer and its use as a connection pooler. It talks about how it works, how you can set up authentication so you're connecting to a PG Bouncer as if it were a Postgres server and then it basically pulls the connections and uses fewer connections on the database side. And it goes through the different configuration settings and how you can adjust certain things to increase the pool size, certain things to increase the number of max client connections, the max DB connections, and max user connections. So it has this representation here. Basically, you keep more live connections open here using fewer uh, database connections. Now, th it'll use fewer as long as you're using certain pooling modes. So the most popular pooling mode is transaction mode, where each transaction will run on a separate PG Bouncer connection. There's no guarantee they're all going to be running on within the same session. You can achieve that with session pooling mode, but again, that doesn't let you use fewer connections on the database server because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, one session on PG Bouncer, one session on the database. But transaction pooling, you could have multiple transactions that can actually happen across sessions. So that enables you to use fewer connections. It's a, essentially a many to one possibility. So it lets you be more efficient, but then you lose, uh, you can't set sessions and do certain things in, in that way. And then you also have a statement pooling mode, which is also popular. But generally, I've, the configuration is done using uh, transaction pooling. So they go into discussions about why you would choose PG Bouncer over some other solutions. Uh, and then what can PG Bouncer not do? Basically, high availability or failover that you may be able to get through things like from things like a PG Pool. So if you're interested in learning more about PG Bouncer, this is a blog post to check out. Uh, a next one related to PG Bouncer is can PG Bouncer handle failover to a new machine? And this is from the EnterpriseDB.com blog. And they talk about a PG Bouncer and how they have set up things, but they EDB has a tool called the uh, Failover Manager that uses a virtual IP capability. So with being able to have a virtual IP address and then flip that out, you can do failovers. Um, so presumably some of the things that PG, can, PG Bouncer cannot do, they mentioned here, you could use a tool such as the EDB Failover Manager to be able to do those sorts of things, have a, a bit of a seamless failover. And they discuss and show some of that here. So if you're interested in using PG Bouncer, these are have our two posts that you may want to check out. The next post is DB Log, a generic change data capture framework. And this is from the uh, Netflix tech blog on medium.com. And this is a new uh, CDC or a new change data capture tool called DB Log. So it basically monitors the log files from different database systems. They talk about uh, my SQL, PostgreSQL, MariaDB. Uh, so it does support PostgreSQL right now. And it looks for changes to the data and then streams those elsewhere for, say, applying to a data mart, a data warehouse, or you need to kick off some sort of processing. So it goes over in depth to this tool so it, and how it works and why they chose to design it versus some other CDC 
tools that exist. So if you're using a change data capture for a certain use case, and you're perhaps want to look at a new tool to, that could offer some different features, definitely check out this blog post. The last set of posts are all related to PostgreSQL table functions. Now by table functions, they're referring to functions in PostgreSQL that would actually return a table of data. So this goes through over an introduction about what they are, how you can use them, the different ways that they can be uh, configured. Now they're just functions, but they return essentially a table of data. An example is generate series. So you can do a select from this function. So this is can kind of like a table function. Now, this is from the Yugabyte DB blog on medium.com, but all the content they mentioned here is actually applicable to PostgreSQL as well. Uh, the second post in the series is implementing PostgreSQL user-defined table functions in Yugabyte DB. But again, you could do this in PostgreSQL and it talks about the implementation and how you can uh, set it up uh, different functions to, to do this. And the last post is four compelling use cases for PostgreSQL table functions. Uh, so the first case is you want a parameterized view. Second case is pretty printed ad hoc reports for administrators. Third case is uh, a dynamic in list. And the last case is compact syntax for bulk inserts. So three sets of posts talking about table functions. So if you're interested in that type of content, definitely blog posts to check out. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode. Or you could subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.